Welcome. What were the medical firsts in the steel city of Sheffield over the last 200 years? We set out to find these in the Overend Night series of medical history podcasts, named after two of the founding figures of medical education in Sheffield in the 1800s. As the University of Sheffield Medical School approaches its bicentenary in 2028, each episode in the series will feature medical discoveries discussed by scientists, medical experts and medical historians. Listen to find out about the personalities involved, life in Sheffield over the past two centuries, scientific research discoveries and where some of the medical treatments we take for granted today actually came from. Hello, I'm Alan Pacey, scientist, broadcaster and academic. And with me today are Jackie Elliott, Senior Lecturer in Diabetes at the University of Sheffield, Solomon Testafay, Professor of Diabetes Medicine at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, and Mike Collins, a retired consultant radiologist, but here as a medical historian. In this podcast, we're talking about Sir Stuart Goodwin, a great Sheffield industrialist and philanthropist who was one of the first diabetic patients in the United Kingdom to be treated successfully with insulin following its discovery in Toronto in 1921. Jackie, before we get on to the details about Goodwin, could you tell us a bit more about diabetes? Thank you, Alan. Yes, there are many types of diabetes, and type 2 is the most common. It's often related to obesity, but there are other causes due to genetic defects, But what Goodwin had was type 1 diabetes, which is the second most common cause of diabetes and is caused because of autoimmune destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas. So people with type 1 diabetes don't produce insulin? That's right. They produce a very, very tiny amount that's not nearly enough to control the blood glucose. So how would Goodwin have known he had diabetes? How would he have been diagnosed? So what normally happens is that very quickly, over one or two weeks, people start noticing that they're very tired, they're very thirsty, often getting up several times a night in order to pass urine, and they start losing weight. And other family members might notice that they're losing weight and drinking lots. So nowadays, that's what would prompt somebody to go to their doctor. Were there diagnostic tests at the time? Would would there have been blood tests or things that could have been done to help with that? No blood tests at the time, so it would have been done on a history, and also you could actually taste the glucose in urine, but we don't do that nowadays. My word. Um, what was the prognosis for a, for a patient with type 1 diabetes back in the 20s, 1920s? Absolutely dire. So people that were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at that time, basically it was a death sentence. They knew that there was no treatment and that they were going to starve slowly and die within weeks or years, maximum one or two years. Mike, you're a medical historian now, and you've been researching this story. Uh, Can you tell us a bit about Goodwin? Was he a Sheffield lad? Yes, he was, Alan. Goodwin was born in Upperthorpe, Sheffield, in 1886. Upperthorpe is part of Sheffield, close to where the university students tend to live now. Stuart's father, he had a steel business in Sheffield, but he died suddenly when Stuart was just 19. Stuart found himself running the father's business, and he was very successful. The business gradually expanded to become one of the most successful businesses of its type in Sheffield. However, by 1920, when he was 34, Goodwin was diagnosed with severe type 1 diabetes. Jackie, is it common for somebody in their 30s to be diagnosed? I always thought this was something you might be born with or get, get younger in life. It is more common in younger people. So in children, and I was talking to some medical students today and let them know that they were still at risk. I'm still at risk, but I'm older than them. So your risk does decrease with age, but type 1 can happen at any age. And Solomon, if I could bring you in here now. I, I know that patients with type 1 diabetes are at risk of a whole manner of complications to do with their vision or their circulation was was Goodwin at risk of any of this this would not have been possible because people just lived for a year or two and rapidly died and you need a few years at least to develop diabetic chronic diabetic complications type 1 diabetes is associated with macrovascular disease or large vessel disease such as cardiovascular disease and strokes 
It is also associated with micro or small vessel disease, and these are chronic kidney disease, diabetic neuropathy, the diabetic foot, and uh, diabetic retinopathy or sight-threatening uh, retinal damage. But these tend to develop after a few years, and you wouldn't have been, wouldn't have had those complications. So pretty bleak, the fact you're not going to live long enough to develop the complications that we now know exist in these patients. Absolutely. And it was Jocelyn, actually, from uh, the United States who coined the era of diabetic coma was replaced by the era of diabetic complications as people started to get insulin, then the complications started to come. So Jackie Goodwin must have felt pretty terrible, I mean, mentally. Indeed. And we know that Goodwin had stated that he'd not yet made up his mind whether he was going to die of starvation or in a diabetic coma. Was it such a stark choice as that for the patient? Yes, people knew that they had a limited lifespan. So doctors who had some insight, if they got type 1 diabetes, knew that they had no future and they just had to plan for the little time that they had left. Let's get back to Goodwin. Mike, how come he was treated with this newly discovered insulin and how come he was treated in Sheffield? Goodwin's plight came to the attention of Edward Mellenby in 1920 when he, that's Goodwin, volunteered uh, for a research project on the metabolism of alcohol in patients who had been diagnosed with diabetes. A Sheffield newspaper at the time stated that the men working in Goodwin's factory thought he looked like uh, skin and bone. And um, we know from subsequent evidence that he weighed only six stone, 36 kilograms at that time. And that's because he was on a strict low-carbohydrate diet, as described by Jackie. Sheffield and Melby's team were chosen by the Medical Research Council to carry out the first trials of insulin in Britain in late 1922. And Goodwin, who was now 37 years old, was one of the first patients to be enrolled in the trial. Insulin was prepared under licence from the Medical Research Council in the University of Sheffield Laboratories from bovine pancreatic tissue that was obtained from local abattoirs. So insulin was used in Sheffield from the end of January 1923 by the team, Mellonby and the team at the Royal Infirmary. And the, one of the first patients to be treated was Stuart Goodwin. And we know from records that Goodwin was very ill at the time, and that he was a patient at the Royal Infirmary for about six months. So I know you said earlier that uh, Goodwin went as low as six stone in weight and made a remarkable turnaround, I think doubling his weight in the next six months once he went on insulin. And there are some remark- a remarkable pair of photographs that we, that we have. Yes. We'll put a link to those photographs associated with the podcast so you can take a look. So that's really incredible that all that happened in Sheffield exactly 100 years ago as we're, re- we're recording this. Jackie, wh- what happened? Did Goodwin survive? Yes, he did survive and he thrived and he went on to live another 30 years or so. Uh, after several months of treatment, he went back to his workmen and they failed to recognise him because he'd regained the weight that he'd lost and he looked completely different. Wow, what a, what a transformation. How long would it take for him to gain that, that amount of weight? Well, I saw a young man that I hadn't seen for five weeks since I last saw him on critical care, and I walked past him in the waiting room. I didn't recognise him. So it happens now quite quickly because we get them onto insulin, obviously better insulin than there were back then. And so within about two or three weeks, people are feeling very different, and they continue to improve because physiologically they've taken a massive hit. So it does take a few weeks to really feel very well again. So what we're describing here really is now what we call today experimental medicine. What do we know about the personalities involved in this and and why was Sheffield the place to do it at the time? Edward Mellenby was the key personality, subsequently famous because of his groundbreaking work on rickets. And he was appointed as Professor of Pharmacology and Honorary Physician at the Royal Infirmary in 1920. Now this joint appointment was unusual at the time and it highlighted the unique cooperation between the university and the Royal Infirmary. Mellonby had already established a very strong reputation as as a researcher at Cambridge and in London and he was attracted to Sheffield because of the potential of the joint appointment and also because research facilities were already in place at Lodgemoor Hospital. 
and a multidisciplinary team was then established at the Royal Infirmary to treat this first group of patients, and that comprised of physicians, physiologists and laboratory staff, and a clinical assistant was appointed to monitor blood sugars, and the results of the initial trial were reported back to the Medical Research Council. Now, forgive the question, but what I'm thinking at the moment is individual details about patients are normally restricted and it's confidential between their doctor and the patient as to what goes on. So how do we know all these details about Goodwin? You're, you're correct, Alan, in saying that we don't have the records, they're not available. So it's gleaning from various sources, including newspaper reports. And when Mellonby died in 1955, obituaries talked about his achievements and they, they did talk about what happened in Sheffield. The obituaries were written by people who knew Mellonby personally. So was this all free? I mean, we have an NHS these days where we provide free treatments to patients. Did not uh, Goodwin have to pay for his own treatment? Goodwin had to pay for his own treatment. Obviously, it was a long time before the NHS, and he was treated at the Royal Infirmary, which was a charitable institution. In other words, it got no money from the public purse. Records subsequently from the Royal Infirmary tell us that Mellonby proposed that they'd set aside four beds for fee-paying patients and any money that was generated on the back of this initiative would be used for patients who couldn't pay for their own care or their own insulin. What was Goodwin's life like after his transition onto insulin? Yeah, Goodwin went on to enjoy a long and very successful career in industry. He was Managing Director and Chairman of Leibstand Steel and Tool Corporation, and the business was situated in Callum Island, which is now a well-known uh, part of Sheffield. He also had an interest in the hospitality industry. We're aware from conversations that I've had with surviving members of the family that he managed his diabetes very carefully and that Sunday lunch, very much uh, the timing of it revolved uh, around his insulin injections. Uh, so Stuart and his w- wife, Lady Florence, made many donations to charities in Sheffield and nationally. They provided funding for the new sports centre at the university, later known as the Goodwin Sports Centre. Sheffielders remember the Goodwin Fountain on Fargate. There was, and that's uh, subsequently been incorporated into the redeveloped Peace Gardens. He never uh, forgot to count his blessings and he made significant donations to Sheffield Cathedral. He implemented the purchase of the Bradbury Silver Collection for the Cutlass Company, something that might have been lost to Sheffield, and he funded engineering research uh, studentships in Sheffield and Cambridge. He was knighted in 1953 and he died in 1969, aged 83 years. 83? Jackie, that is a remarkable age given his initial prospects. It is indeed, and nowadays people get medals if they live for 50 or 60 years with type 1 diabetes, and because we've got some people that have survived right from the beginning, Diabetes UK, the national charity, now gives out medals to people who have lived 70 and 80 years with type 1 diabetes. Solomon, how would the treatment of a new patient presenting now in 2023 differ from what Goodwin experienced 100 years ago? It's massively different. We now have a multidisciplinary team that uh, look after people with type 1 diabetes. People with type 1 diabetes have diabetes education on how to self-manage the condition. They started on insulin straight away and their symptoms improve quickly. So uh, the situation is completely dramatically different from what happened many years ago, 100 years ago. And I've seen, I've seen people around with these like discs on their on their arm. Jackie, I know you're involved in this kind of monitoring. That's now, I think, changed the life of many people remarkably, I think. Definitely. I mean, we still have patients that remember doing the old Benedict's test, urine testing for glucose. They will have also had to use a syringe and glass bottles and need to sterilise their syringes and sharpen their own needles after each insulin injection. Whereas now, as Solomon said, things are so much better we give them insulin pens where the needles are tiny. It looks like a bit like a normal fountain pen with a cartridge in. But also now there are insulin pumps that can deliver a small amount of insulin over a short space of time. And in terms of monitoring, as you said, there's these special sensors that can sense 
the glucose in the interstitial fluid. And finally, we've got to the point where these sensors are now good enough to talk to insulin pumps and help regulate the flow of insulin. No more timing of the Sunday lunch around your insulin. Uh, Well, still a little bit, because the pumps and the sensors are not psychic. They don't know how much somebody like yourself might want for a Sunday lunch, and we still need to be able to teach people with diabetes how much extra insulin they need to cover the carbohydrate in food. But when you're not eating or not doing extensive exercise, then these systems can help regulate the glucose, and it means that you always wake up now with the perfect glucose, something Goodwin would never have been able to know for sure. So it sounds as though Sheffield was really at the cutting edge of research into diabetes in Goodwin's time. Is this a, an area where Sheffield is still at the forefront? Sheffield is at the forefront of uh, diabetes currently and in the past. For this, there have been two towering figures, Professor John Ward, who came to Sheffield in early 1970s and worked at the Royal and then later on at the Royal Hallamshire Hospital, and also Mrs. Mary McKinnon, a diabetes specialist nurse who was a pioneer of diabetes management in the community. As I think many people will know, diabetes is treatment now delivered at the general practice level. And uh, Mary McKinnon pioneered this and she upskilled the practice nurses in Sheffield to have the skills on how to help diabetes nurses in the community to help people with diabetes manage their, their blood glucose control, etc. So Sheffield was also one of the centres where the diabetes centre, the concept of diabetes centre, which is very much a sort of patient-centred institution started. It started in London at King's, but soon after, uh, Professor John Ward and Mary McKinnon had started the diabetes centre at the Royal Hallamshaw Hospital, which bears uh, Professor Ward's name. So um, since then, there have been a lot of innovations, and perhaps we can come to them later. Well, that was my next question. So, you know, what does the future hold over the next 100 years for somebody with type 1 diabetes? Where are the next innovations going to come from? The system I was talking about, where the sensors are good enough to talk to the insulin pumps, uh, we were one of the pilot centres in the country that have collected data in the same way as the MRC was asking for data before NHS England have asked for data and we've contributed to that so new nice guidance will be published shortly and maybe by the time this podcast is on air as to which people are going to be eligible for that system because it does come down to money it is a much more expensive treatment than using pens so in terms of the The monitoring and the delivery of insulin, I think we've got about as far as we can. Moving forward, we still want to know if there's a cure, and that's what patients want to know. And so there's lots of work around immunotherapy, and as yet there's not a cure, but there is some inkling that we're getting to the point where we might be able to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. We now have an era where people are living, longevity has increased, and with this comes lots of diabetic complications. And these diabetes complications consume enormous uh, scarce resources, that uh, medical resources that we have. And one of the things that Sheffield has excelled recently is in the concept of the one-stop shop, in which patients with type 1 diabetes, and indeed type 2 diabetes, have everything done for them in one go. They have eye drops put in into their eyes to dilate for retinal photography while that's working. Their feet are checked by a podiatrist and they also have blood tests taken, all nine care processes done in one go. And within 30 to 40 minutes they leave. And this has been adapted by Jackie and her, and her colleagues for the young persons clinic, uh, out of work hours, Um, to ensure that every patient with type 1 and type 2 diabetes has those nine annual health checks. And um, Sheffield's uptake has increased, and this has won the NHS Innovation Award for 2021. This service is now being delivered in Sheffield. And um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy has hitherto been considered a disease of the peripheral nervous system. In fact, that's not the case, and these emerged from from Sheffield that there is spinal cord involvement, reduction in spinal cord, cross-sectional section. Again, this was published in in The Lancet. And later on, 
Um, there is also involvement of the somatosensory cortex, a reduction in cortical volume of the grey matter volume in the somatosensory cortex. Functional changes, impaired circulation in the thalamus and in the pain processing areas of the brain in those with painful neuropathy. And, and all these are now changing the paradigm from a purely peripheral nerve damage causing diabetic neuropathy to the whole of the central ner- nervous system involved in the pathophysiology and pathogenesis of diabetic peripheral neuropathy and diabetic painful neuropathy. And this has really opened a whole new area for research in the field of diabetic neuropathy. A lot of other in- innovations have come and very difficult to detail all of them in one go, but if I can highlight a couple of those. Um, for instance, treatment for painful diabetic neuropathy, which, is, which affects one in four people with diabetes, uh, can be extremely intractable, non-responsive to um, current pharmacological treatments. And what Sheffield has come up with is spinal cord stimulation, which has been used previously for other conditions. But um, the, we did the study here in Sheffield to show that spinal cord stimulation can benefit patients with uh, intractable painful neuropathy that doesn't respond to oral medications. And this was published in The Lancet. The other innovation that has come from Sheffield is... Until really recently, until uh, about 30 years ago, we didn't know what causes this diabetic complication. Is it just blood glucose levels or are there other factors that cause this uh, chronic diabetic complications? And for, for neuropathy, for instance, we followed 3,250 patients over seven years in 31 centres, 16 European countries. And we found that the, not, apart from glucose Traditional markers of macrovascular disease, such as high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking, were the drivers of peripheral neuropathy. So the treatment of peripheral neuropathy should not just be focused on glucose control, but the effective management of cardiovascular uh, risk factors. And this uh, seminal paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there have been other innovations, but perhaps... uh, Time will preclude me from mentioning this today. Well, I want to ask Jackie, I've heard about this Daphne project. Could you explain a little more about what that is? Thank you. So type 1 diabetes is different, in my opinion, to every other condition in that it's the only one where I can think of where the patient decides how much of the drug they need. So I write a prescription for insulin, but then I put variable dose. And so the person with diabetes needs to decide how much carbohydrate they're going to eat, and how much insulin they need for that. And uh, all of us in the studio today would need different amounts of insulin for the same meal. It's very individual. So along with King's and Northumbria, Sheffield was one of the first three centres to do the randomised control trial of Daphne, dose adjustment for normal eating. And this was designed to help people like Goodwin plan how much insulin he was going to give, but also if he didn't want to eat his Sunday lunch, to keep himself safe and not to have the insulin. And so we know that educating patients with diabetes about how to manage their own condition really helps prevent the complications of diabetes that Solomon's so eloquently explained. And we know that having that knowledge actually helps people feel better. So they're able to plan and have a more spontaneous life and have better family life because they know how to look after their own condition and by having a lower glucose this means that they then avoid the complications of diabetes so what we're talking about in this is some very high tech care for patients in multiple domains but how does this compare to what happens across the rest of the world i'm thinking about low middle income countries solomon the situation is dire and the key problem at the moment is access to insulin and affordability Um, and these are lacking in many poorer countries of the world. In poorer countries of the world managing a child with type 1 diabetes can consume up to 25% of the total income of that family. It can be extremely devastating and Um, Insulin is also not available during times of disaster in Afghanistan, 
in the Tigray war in Ethiopia where even doctors couldn't access insulin and as a result doctors with type 1 diabetes died as a result of this easily treatable condition. In the United States, people, uninsured people are unable to access adequate amounts of insulin and have to limit their insulin use leading to attendance of emergency care with diabetic coma. So in many parts of the world, availability of insulin is not, uh, uh, it, and, and affordability is limited, unlike our NHS, which is really tremendous because everybody can access insulin in our country. So the NHS, 75 years old, but before the NHS started, I am aware of people where families had to choose whether they were going to buy insulin for their child or buy food. So you can imagine that sometimes the child got insulin and sometimes the other children got fed. So unfortunately, we do know that people very often did go blind or suffer amputations or die of kidney failure just because they couldn't afford insulin. And it's still ongoing at the moment. As Solomon said, in poorer countries, a lot of the problem is refrigeration. So the insulin that you're about to use, you can keep out, but other insulin that's you're not going to use for a month or two, has to be kept cool. Regarding uh, funding of insulin, if we go back to 1923 and look at the records, I mentioned earlier that people like Goodwin paid for the insulin and some beds that were set aside, any income that was generated was used for the patients who couldn't pay. But the difficulty they encountered were when patients were discharged from hospital, they needed insulin every day. And um, there was no funding provided within the uh, Royal Infirmary. So what happened was that each case was considered case-by-case basis by the uh, weekly board. And they got the hospital almoner involved who went out and investigated the patient's circumstances as to whether, in fact, they might be able to pay or not. There were very difficult times in Sheffield, not just around uh, the world as we've been hearing about. And Goodwin was a very generous man. I mean, did Goodwin ever, to our knowledge, pay for other patients' not treatment? Directly. Not directly, but he, he it's quite interesting. He paid for um, other patients' comforts, and um, within a month of he being treated, in uh, about March time, there's a minute saying that he bought a stove for the ward and some facilities for the kitchens. Now, he had a vested interest in that himself because he was only six stone in weight, so he'd be very susceptible to the cold weather in, in Sheffield in March. And when he, when he left the hospital, he made a further donation. And, of course, that continued a stream of donations throughout his, his career. Can I ask a question about Goodwin's hospitalisation? Because you said he was in hospital for six months, Mm -hmm. and presumably that was part of a recovery phase Mm -hmm. where he was closely monitored Mm -hmm. and given his insulin. But what happened for the rest of his life? Was he discharged and managing himself in the way that we've heard Jackie describe? Well, we don't know precisely how he was managed. And I think what got to remember was that he was a true guinea pig, as were all the patients in 1923. And it was very much trial and error, and they didn't have all the nice, fancy needles and other equipment. So there must have been a long learning curve, I would suspect, for many years, but perhaps some of my clinical colleagues could help. Can you even hypothesise, Jackie, what he would, how he would have managed himself over the rest of his life, from, what, 35 to 82, 83? One of the things we've not mentioned is what happens if somebody with diabetes gives themselves too much insulin. And so if Goodwin got the dose wrong or his doctors got the dose wrong initially, then his blood glucose would have gone too low and he would have had hypoglycemia. And at that point, people with diabetes feel awful. So they get uh, an adrenaline response and they get palpitations, they feel very anxious, uh, they can feel dizzy, get tingling of their lips... They can appear confused, they can slur their words. If the dose is far too big, then they might pass out. So lots of people, once they'd had one hypo, would never want another hypo again. And that's where we come back to the sensors today are so good at monitoring glucose that they alarm at people to let them know when their glucose is running lower. And what this has meant is that they can run their average glucose lower to help avoid the chronic hyperglycemia and the risk of complications from their diabetes. When I spoke to uh, Goodwin's granddaughter recently, she was telling me about Sunday lunch that I mentioned earlier. 
And Goodwin's daughter was a nurse at the Royal Infirmary and she had to be about in case he developed a hypoglycemic attack. Uh, I don't think it actually happened, but uh, he was very stringent and um, he, he wouldn't uh, embark on a big lunch without his daughter being there to care for him in case things went wrong. Jackie, I think you're well known in your research and in your, in your clinical care for the care of young people. It must be terribly difficult for young people to manage this. I mean, what is the toll on their psychology or their mental health? It is really difficult for them. Growing up for any teenager is really difficult. There are lots of changes. You're just desperate. You want to fit in with your peers. You want to be just like them, do the things that they do without too much planning, be very spontaneous. And type 1 diabetes really impinges on that. So a lot of them really struggle to accept the treatment that they need and the routine that they need to have really good diabetes care. So we're fortunate in Sheffield that we've really fought to have clinical psychology expertise within our clinic. To add to that, uh, Sheffield was the first centre in the country to involve a psychologist as part of the multidisciplinary team. Professor Claire Bradley started uh, in the 1980s before my time in Sheffield and She's published quite a lot in this era. With longevity comes diabetic complications, and some people can have, in fact, a whole host of complications at the same time. These can be extremely devastating. Being on dialysis, having painful neuropathy, having peripheral vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, all these can come, or, or vision-threatening, or uh, not a long time ago, and people with amputations coming to the clinic. And this can be extremely devastating, um, not only to the individual, but to carers, family, and of course society as a whole. And psychology is really central to helping people to manage not only their diabetes to improve their quality of life, but there are many aspects of psychology, in, including mindfulness and behavior therapy. Others have been used to help people cope with the massive demands of uh, diabetes. Of course, many people manage very well. Indeed, people with type 1 diabetes now achieve, you know, have successful careers, sporting careers, and being prime minister, and uh, other major achievements. Uh, um, so um, things have changed. The outlook is, is changing constantly with improved quality of life for people with diabetes. But psychology it hugely plays a, a, a huge central law role to help people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. What a fascinating story of collaboration, altruism, generosity, and early experimental medicine. Uh, we've made this podcast to recognise the 100th anniversary of such an important event in the treatment of diabetes and to recognise the braveness of Sir Stuart Goodwin, a much-loved son of Sheffield, and it's Good to hear that the research into diabetes and experimental medicine still continues in Sheffield with staff in the university and the hospital trust conducting trials for the benefit of patients in Sheffield and the wider region, just as they did 100 years ago. In helping to tell this story, I'd like to thank Jackie Elliott, Solomon Testafay and Mike Collins. This podcast was produced by Andy Tattersall and Sheila Francis. I'm Alan Pacey. Thank you for listening. Thank you.